is our symposium and I would like to invite Mr. Claudio Pinuer to give, up, give us some welcome words right now. So Claudio, could you please start? And activate your microphone, please. Um, we can't hear you because your microphone is still silenced. So could you please activate your, uh, yes, I'm right sorry. now. I'm Perfect. I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm grateful to Susan Reichman and Mario Gomez for the opportunity to offer a reading at the opening and the Ecosystem and Society Symposium on behalf of the Facultad de Humanidades y Arte de la Universidad de Concepción, I could like to express our gratitude for the long collaboration between Germany and this university, which has benefited many students and has allowed a fruitful academic exchange. Surely, the theme of this symposium will generate deep reflection and valuable exchange of experience about the relationship between language, culture, and society. Three, and separate human construction. Thank you. Thank you very much and welcome. Thanks a lot. Claudio, so um, I will leave the floor to Anna Richter from the German Embassy. Uh, your microphone is not activated, I'm sorry. It was activated, the host muted me. Now, um, estimado Dr. Pinuer, estimado científico, And I was asked to speak in English, so that's what I'm going to do. Um, we are experiencing peculiar times. You will allow me this little euphemism. And every day we are reminded how fragile our little human ecosystem is and how dependent we are on, on scientific progress. But the challenges clearly reach beyond Corona. From forests and farmlands to freshwater oceans and coasts, the vitality and diversity of Earth's ecosystems are the basis of human prosperity and well-being. Yet we are degrading these precious resources in alarming ways. Freshwater ecosystems supply food, water and energy to billions of people protect us from recent floods and provide unique habitat for many plants and animals, including one third of all vertebrate species. These ecosystems range from mangroves shielding our coasts against tsunamis and erosion to inland lakes and rivers teeming with fish and wetlands that filter and moderate water flows while storing vast amounts of carbon. However, freshwater ecosystems are particularly degraded. They face pollution from chemicals, plastics and sewage, as well as overfishing and overextraction of water to irrigate crops, generate power and supply industry and homes. Rivers face additional impacts from dams, canalization and mining for sand and gravel. Wetlands are being drained for agriculture with some 87% lost globally since in the last 300 years, and more than 50% since 1900. One in three freshwater species are threatened with extinction. And here you come in. It is folks like you who are making an effort to turn the tide and give people and nature a sustainable future. Of course, you are familiar with the matter, and I'm not going to give you solutions, nor will I pretend that I can compete with you on the top. So what I wanted to tell you is this. I would be extremely pleased if you allowed Germany to give you a hand in your undertakings. 
you have the contact details of the German Foreign Academic Exchange Service, the DAAD. So just get in touch. Ask them all your queries. If you wanted to study and research in Germany to the mutual benefit of our societies, we will do everything within our means to make that possible. Honestly, <laughs> just get in touch. There are various grants that they, are, they will inform you about, and we at the embassy will take care of visa issues and such. So fear not, it will be worthwhile. I'm looking forward to hear from you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Anna Richter from the German Embassy. Um, right now it's my turn. Uh, and in the name of the German Academic Exchange Service, I would like to give you a very warm welcome to our symposium, Ecosystems and Society. Especially, I'd like to welcome Mr. Claudio Pinuel, Vice Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Arts of the University of Concepcion, Anna Richter from the German Embassy, and our special guests today, Professor Maria Stockenreiter from the Ludwig Maximilians University of Munich, <laughs> long name, and uh, Jens Benner, who graduated from the University of Concepcion and actually is um, finishing his master at uh, the LMU as well. And I would like to uh, welcome my dear colleague uh, Mario Gomez, our DAAD representative in Concepcion. Um, this is our second symposium um, in a series of events with focus on climate change, one of the most issues of our time. And um, the DAD slogan is change by exchange. I really like it in English. Um, and actually it's our idea of today's event to exchange ideas between our special guests, but also with the audience. So feel free to make questions at the end. Um, but we also intend with this event to reinforce our very good and traditional cooperation between the DAAD and the University of Concepcion. The idea of this event is to, to promote Germany as a, de as a destination of investigation, as Anna Richter from the embassy already mentioned. And right now, in a virtual environment, we decided to split off the information session about investigation in Germany and scholarships. So we are happy to invite you this Thursday at 11 a.m. to our virtual talk about investigation and scholarships in Germany. Please are uh, as Instagram, uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, and so on. You can find us as DAAD Chile. And um, I would like to thank as well as Jose Miguel Morales. He's in charge of the study program of arts. And I would like to thank you, my dear colleague, uh, Pablo Navarrete, for all his uh, support. And well, right now, I would like to give the floor to Mario Gomez, and we start. Thank you, Susanna, and um, thanks uh, to everyone you already mentioned. I, I won't repeat um, what, what you already said. I will just say that these thanks could be doubled or should be doubled. Well, um, I am here in Concepcion, as you mentioned. Behind me is the beautiful campus at the, uh, of the University of Concepcion, for those who don't know it. Um, and uh, the University of Concepcion is building up a project um, with the LMU in Munich. And this is a bit the background for, for this symposium we're holding today. This is going to be a cooperation project in the field of so-called arts and science. Um, we're trying to build bridges, not just between Germany and Chile. We're also trying to build bridges between the sciences, the different sciences. And um, for this, we're building up a project that is being financed very generously by Bailat, uh, the fund from uh, Bayern, Bavaria. And uh, we are starting this project now in uh, 2021 in the second semester this year. And Maria Stockenreiter, who Susanne already introduced, is one of the key figures in this binational cooperation that we're building up. And she's assistant professor for aquatic ecology at the LMU in Munich. 
holder of a PhD in ecology at the same university. And uh, among other things, she was a research associate, not just at LMU in Munich, but also at the Michigan State University in the United States. I won't go into further detail into um, Maria's uh, uh, huge CV. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to, to have you here with us. Um, and uh, we're all very, very um, curious as to your uh, presentation, which has the title, The Unknown World of Freshwater Plankton and Why Should We Care? Maria Stockenreiter, nice to have you here with us, please. So first, thank you all for hosting me. It's a pleasure to, to give a symposium here. So that's really nice to have the opportunity to talk about my research. And actually, I hope that I add some more information because Anna Richter already uh, summarized the importance of fresh water is very nice. So, so I hope that I, that I will add something to it. And as I was told that the audience is quite broad, I keep it, I hope, easy and nice to understand what we do and um, why plankton is important. So thanks again for, for the invitation. It's really cool. And I just start sharing my screen. And we can uh, start with the talk, which I hope that I really can get through in 20 minutes. So I hope you all see my screen. Mario, do, do you see yeah. my screen? Yeah. Oh, okay. Good. So um, what you see here is uh, yeah, the title, what, what we were talking about, right? So uh, the unknown world of freshwater plankton and why should we care? And today I was just thinking of that we just do a small jump into the water, right? So, and um, you see here a nice dog jumping into a fresh water. And we, we are living on a, on, on a planet which is very often called the water planet. And for a good reason, because um, most of our planet is covered in water. But what you see and where the dog is jumping in is fresh water. And that's only a small amount of this whole water we have on Earth. And most of this fresh water is anyway somehow caught in the ice caps and in glaciers and in groundwater we not use. And so only 1% of this fresh water is available for us. So it's not a lot, but we really depend on it as Anna before already um, told us. And when we think about fresh water, then we usually think about lakes or rivers, right? So this is what, what we do. But I will show you some results now in the next 20 minutes from lake studies, not from, from rivers. So that's Jens uh, uh, part then for the rivers. And I will stay with the um, lakes. So in most cases, when we think of fresh water and lakes, then we think about fish or ducks, or some of you might also think of water plants or macrophytes, right? So most of you will not think about tiny creatures like phytoplankton or plankton as such. And if we think about tiny, then tiny has always a negative kind of meaning, maybe unimportant or not so nice and so on. But, and some of you will also think about this guy from SpongeBob or all of you who have kids, I think you get uh, this every now and then. And this guy always thinks that plankton rocks, but if this is really the case, we will go through and I will show you why, because I can already say, yes, plankton rocks, right? So, so yeah, let's go into this deeper. So we are talking today about plankton. What is plankton? Plankton are drifters, so they cannot um, compete with the water current or so. They are just swimming around and they are sometimes just being in the water. And what do you see? Here is a nice overview of a plankton community, which is under the microscope. So we are really tiny and this plankton is really nice. So here you see actually not the freshwater plankton, it's a marine plankton because you find it also in marine waters, not only in freshwater, but as I am mostly a freshwater ecologist, I will talk about the freshwater plankton, but most of the things I tell you hold also for the marine plankton. So within this plankton, 
we have also two groups mainly, or we distinguish between the big two groups. There is on one hand the zooplankton, which is zoo, something is um, animals, right? So the consumers in there, so like us, so we have to eat something like plants or whatever. So the zooplankton, you see here a main player. So Daphnia or the water flea is a main player in, in freshwater zooplankton communities, which are very important for fish. And there is phytoplankton and phyto, some of you might know, has something to do with plants or something like this. They are photosynthetic active. And you see they are really tiny. And this is also a magnification of 400 times. So we are under the microscope right now. How to distinguish these two, um, these two groups is mainly how they gather their energy. And whereas phytoplankton is made mainly gathering their energy from, with the help of sunlight uh, and some nutrients and CO2. So they convert it into organic energy or in organic biomass. And this is what we also know from our gra terrestrial grass or plants, right? What they all as well do. And these are the main players converting inorganic energy into some organic biomass. And the others who are feeding on them and eat them, right? So this is what we have in plankton, basically. Very simple spoken, but that's um, how it is. Actually, they, like these, the Daphne, they always get most of the attention because they're so cute and kids usually say, ah, that's cute if you show them a model and so on. But the real stars actually is phytoplankton. Why is the phytoplankton like here schematically drawn? Why? Why is it so important? It's important because they are photosynthetic active, as I told you. So they use the sun and some nutrients, water and so on to build up biomass, what we cannot do, what we have to eat or the fish or the zooplankton has to eat. And a very, very important issue is if you really take a deep breath and you take a second deep breath, then think about that the second breath Death came from the oxygen produced by phytoplankton. So 50% of the global oxygen is really produced by phytoplankton. So they are kind of important also for us, not only for these tiny creatures in the lake, right? So they're really cool. And by building up a lot of biomass without stems or complicated leaves or whatever, what our trees are doing, they of course are very important then for the global carbon and nutrient cycle. So they are are the main players in that. And with that, and if you also look into this very simplified food chain in that uh, case, what we have here with the phytoplankton here and zooplankton here with the Daphnia and fish, where we go more often now then, they, really, uh, they are really the basis of nearly almost all aquatic ecosystems, right? So phytoplankton is really important and they build up all the biomass, what higher trophic levels like fish or Daphnia and so on are eating. So very important. They also have a high diversity and that's very important. We will come to that later, why this high diversity is important, but they are high diverse, way more diverse than our land plants because our terrestrial plants are deriving only from this green algae. So they are very similar, but in the plankton you have some which are not really a plant, Sometimes they, they cannot decide, am I now an animal or a plant? But what they share is that they all do photosynthesis. And that's um, why it's called phytoplankton. And in the end, they are really important for ecosystem service. Because as you already see, hmm, they produce maybe something here and they eat it. And in the end, the fish is eating the plankton, or at least the zooplankton. And all fish are doing that to a certain size even the ones which are eating other fish, but um, they, it's very important. And in the end, it's very important for our ecosystem service because we want to eat the fish in the end, right? And if you just think about that 70% of the population is depending or living on the coastal shore, and then they be, depend, of course, on fish. So it's very important. Um, yeah, so... 
But what we see and what Anne, Anna already also said that our species or the freshwater species are declining in a horrible way, right? So we lose and lose and lose species and not only species, we also lose biomass. What you see here on this graph, where you see phytoplankton and two parts of zooplankton, that's just a size matter. And they decrease and they will decrease if you look into the future here with 2100, basically, right? So, and if if you think again, here again, a food web, if this major part in the middle of a food web will decrease or some species will not appear, that might have tremendous implications for a fish. And this is what we want to eat in the end, right? So this is how it is. And I want to show you now in some slides why it is like that. So are there some reasons why we have uh, this decline? And what does it tell us? And how can we be sure that it is like that? So, and I think this fits very well also in this broad context of the symposium of climate change. One reason or a possible stressor for this whole um, um, species decline is that we have a increasing um, temperature, surface temperature, and when our air temperature is increasing, of course, our water temperature is also increasing. What you see here since the 1960s, we have more and more temperature anomalies and higher temperature also in our lakes. So, and this has some implications. I will show you that later, what implications these are. And usually one stressor is not coming alone. So in, ve in very often you have a second stressor uh, coming with the other one. And that's an another one we all know that we have agricultural runoff, for example, where you have herbicides or it in, yeah, in total pesticides coming into our um, rivers and lakes and eutrophication. So both can act in the same way. So eutrophication would mean that we put in a lot of nutrients, right, into the uh, into lakes and in, on our water bodies. What you see here is a picture from the Baltic Sea, actually, which is an ocean or considered as an ocean. But you see here nice phytoplankton blooms in there caused by higher nutrient input. And how this works, I will show you later. So we have these two stressors which are very important, like higher temperature and nutrient input. And what does that mean for, the, for plankton? I will show you now. How to estimate this, right? So how do we look into that in, when we do research? How are we doing that? So most of you will just think about lab experiments in the first case, right? So that you um, create some communities and you go into the lab and you have some bottles like here, you put into the light what they want, right? To for photosynthesis, which is kind of, of course, good. And you should always go back and forth to lab experiments and field observations, because in these lab experiments, you have a high experimental control. So you can keep temperature at the same uh, uh, at the same level or increase it or whatever you want, right? So you can control it nicely. But as you see here, you're very, very far away from nature, actually. So what is there in nature, right? So how does it, how does it work? Can we really tell from these laboratory experiments without the complex interactions, which are only there in, in the wild nature, can we say something about it? And there is a compromise what we mainly do here at our institute and we do these field experiments looking like that. These are really big bags, plastic bags, where we can enclose parts from a lake and can do our experiments in there, which then is very close to nature, not really nature, but for um, some research you need statistics and you need some replication and this is how you can do it. But you can do it in a very big volume already. And I I will show you now uh, um, data from these mesocosm experiments. We did. So we call these things mesocosms, and I will show you a little bit about that. So we did actually a, um, a experiment where we looked into a temperature increase and what the temperature increase does to the lake. So what it does, and some of you might know from going swimming in the summer, that when you jump into the water, 
that it gets colder when you get deeper. So your lake in summer is stratified and get not mixed nicely. So the whole water column does not get mixed like shown here. So you roughly have a very shallow mixing. And when water temperatures increase in, in spring, then you have rapidly a very thin layer which gets a little bit mixed, but not the whole water column. And this ha that has quite some implications We usually get a lot of cyanobacteria or blue-green algae, which are not the wanted species, right? So we do want to keep them low. If there is a good mixing, then we go more for diatoms, which are uh, nicer ones, better food for the zooplankton. So if the temperature increases and we have more shallow uh, mixing, then we might end up with this unwanted species. And we also get a change in the community composition. So the zooplankton, which eats the phytoplankton, might get an, a different dish. So it would be you eat every day a hamburger, kind of, and you're used to that and you like it with some salad. The next day you get only French fries and you don't want that maybe, right? So that's how you can see it. So this stratification, what does it really cause, as said, it, when there is only a little bit of mixing in the lake because of higher upper water temperatures, you might end up with the cyanobacteria and they nicely bloom as you could see on this nice picture from the Baltic Sea where all this green stuff was swimming around. This was a bloom of a one single cyanobacteria species, one single species. And these blooms are usually not so good because they are very often toxic and they are also not so nice food for the zooplankton. So you can imagine that zooplankton is not so happy about that. And we have kind of a disruption of energy and matter fluxes. So they will not find any food, although there is a lot of biomass, but it's not the right one. And we very often often end up with only one species, which is really a, a problem. And when you do not get a lot of zooplankton, then we do not have the fish on our plate, basically. So that's very simple spoken, but it is like that. As I said, another problem is eutrophication, where we put in a lot of nutrients and, he, and we, just for a rough estimate, we put into our oceans, right? So here's ocean, but as well in our fresh waters for about 40 megatons of nitrogen and 8 megatons phosphorus per year. And that's quite a lot. That's really a lot. And what happens, you can see here, when you add a lot of phosphorus, then something increases here, right? The same if you add a lot of nitrogen, something increases. And the something what increases here, just it increased, is usually the phytoplankton. But usually it's a single species which uh, increases or only a few species who can handle that vast amount of, of nutrients. And you, very often you also end up with these nasty cyanobacteria, what you do not want to have. Because other ones, for example, they do not like that that much. For example, here, that's a green algae. They do not like if you add a lot of ammonia, for example, which is all was a nitrogen source, but they do not like it, right? So several species just decrease when you add that. And what you might end up with that is that you decrease also your diversity in the community when you add a lot of nutrients. Same kind of thing with the temperature that you end up with a one single species bloom or maybe two or three, which are not wanted. That's quite a problem. And yeah, just, just to see that, that eutrophication and the temperature increase as such can cause phytoplankton blooms. But these phytoplankton blooms can, on the one hand, because we think of yeah, if there is more, then maybe that's also good for the zooplankton. But very often, these are unwanted species and not the ones the zooplankton likes. And that has implication then for fish. And these blooms very often also, as a consequence, create a diversity loss. 
and also oxygen depletion in these lakes because they uh, just uh, sink out at some point and then in the deeper waterless you have just a remineralization by bacteria and so on and they need oxygen but the others like zooplankton or fish they also need oxygen so very sometimes you can even see dead fish in a lake when there is too much of an unwanted species blooming. So that has, can get really difficulties for the ecosystem service then in the end. Yeah, but we were, or I was talking a little bit about this diversity loss and also Anna said that, that uh, diversity is quite important and that we need that, but why? So if you just follow here these graphs a little bit, then you have here species richness, meaning that uh, diversity basically. And what we can see is if we increase diversity, then ecosystem functions or how well it works increases as well. So also doing that with, so ecosystem function could be biomass or energy of matter flux and so on. But also this functional diversity um, increases. This means a lot of different species are there with a lot of different traits and they can express a lot of things, right? So that we can say in the end that a higher diversity with a lot of function in my uh, community increases the ecosystem function in the end is good for our ecosystem service, like getting enough fish from a, from a lake or from the ocean as well. And then you can see that here is that we have here again the zooplankton with our little nice Daphnia. And imagine now the Daphnia uh, is, gets eaten by the fish. If there is a lot of Daphnia, good for the fish. We get big fat fish, that's cool. But if they just disappear for whatever reason, because there are these nasty cyanobacteria, for example, the fish yield is smaller and gets or the fish even gets smaller, but we want to have big fish to eat, right? So like this. And why is it like that, that they might die out? I think now it's a little bit clear. It's all about this phytoplankton, what they do. And we did some studies on that. And what you see here in this upper graph is on the x-axis, a diversity, meaning we go from low diverse communities to high diverse communities. And what we can see is the higher the diversity in the phytoplankton is, the bigger our Daphnia are. So we have only little Daphnia or not, not that many, but bigger Daphnia and uh, they grow faster in that case when there is a lot of diversity in it, right? Not only one or two. And what does that mean? These um, differences or these diverse communities they are very often better producers for very various things. Like you might know from, uh, from, uh, from advertisement that fish oil is very uh, healthy or all these omega uh, fatty acids and so on, what you should eat, right? These are all produced like shown here by all these phytoplankton, by primary producers. They uh, produce all these essential fatty acids what we also need and if and we see as well here that if there is more diversity in the phytoplankton we have more of these healthy fatty acids and what does that mean we get more of certain species and they grow better in that case so we can see that we should really decrease all all these uh, nasty things we do to our ecosystems because we, um, uh, we help our ecosystem to function when the diversity is high. And all what we do now is that we very often decrease our diversity with all our actions, what we do. And we should just take home, and I, I hope that I'm in time still and did not talk too long, but as a take home, we really should think of that these phytoplankton, Although they are cute, they're tiny and pretty and so on, but they do a lot for us because, as said, they bring us 50% of the oxygen, very important. They're super important for the carbon and nitrogen, uh, nutrient cycle at, on our Earth. They are very important for ecosystem service because, as you might know now, if, they, if fish does not get enough of this tiny water fleece, we will not have it on our 
our plate, right? So what we want to have. And we also have algae in our daily products and most of the people do not know, right? So that we have it in toothpaste and in, even in Ben and Jerry's. That was also new for me. But yeah, so we need a lot of this algae in our daily products. And we should also keep in mind that long ago, they all created all our fossil fuel. Uh, so we should uh, really thank to, to plankton, thanks to plankton for all these things. And I think I could really uh, say that plankton really rocks. And for this, I really want to thank you for your attention. Of course, also my work group, because with all the help of the others, it's not possible. And I also want to thank you for the invitation. And of course, this is also all not possible without funding. And as said, really plankton rocks. And with that, I stop here, stop sharing and say thank you. Yeah, thank you Plankton and thank you above all Mia for this very interesting uh, presentation. I think we all learned something. I learned a lot, uh, I must say, about uh, not only Plankton but uh, on, on, on a certain uh, complexity that um, we, we don't always have in mind. Um, in case anyone has any questions, you can start writing them in the chat. Afterwards, uh, we'll have a, a small Q&A. But first, let me introduce to you our second speaker, um, who actually works uh, together with Maria Stockenreiter in the LMU in Munich. Actually, um, that's a bit how the connection, this connection came up. Jens Benoer um, is another key figure in this cooperation program that we're building up between Chile and Germany, between the LMU and the Universidad de Concepcion. Um, He's a bridge builder, a native bridge builder, so to say, between Germany and Chile. He was born in Concepcion, of German descent, and after having completed a bachelor and master in social sciences and anthropology here in Concepcion, at the University of Concepcion, UDEC, he is now enrolled in the master program um, Evolution, Ecology and Systematics at the LMU in Munich. And uh, this is also where uh, Jens works uh, together over where he met uh, with, with uh, Maria. So this is a bit the background. And apart from all this, he works in several projects in the field of ecology and will soon be back in Chile for some time as a National Geographic Young Explorer. Um, Jens, thank you for being here. Um, your presentation we're like looking very forward to has the title, The Home River Bio Blitz, a worldwide citizen science event to celebrate rivers. Um, thank you, Jens. The floor is yours. Looking thank forward. you, Mario. Um, first, thank you, Susanne. Thank you, Mario, for the invitation. And also, uh, thank you, Mia, for that nice presentation. It's always refreshing to relearn all that stuff about plankton, which I love. I will now share with you my screen. So you will have to let me know if it's working. Okay. Do you see this? Perfect, nice. So this is a story map. It's it's not a slideshow. It's a really nice um, platform that Arc GIS offers to tell stories using maps, uh, videos, and images. So if you are into storytelling processes, I really recommend it to you. Firstly, like I said, thank you also to you all who are listening to this. And well, Mia presented a very wonderful world, which is uh, often um, not understood correctly. And for example, when I first learned about how plankton makes half of the oxygen in the world, like phytoplankton, basically, I was, whoa, that blew my mind off. Mia remembers that I was like obsessed and writing so uh, articles about uh, science communication that plankton is amazing and so on. And yeah, so basically they really rock like you said Mia and she showed to us uh, why should we care but what I will tell you now uh, is a story about people caring actually for these freshwater ecosystems in this case uh, I will tell you the story of the home river biofits which is a citizen science a place-based citizen science event place-based meaning hands-on outdoors activity uh, worldwide but what 
And it's actually this home rumor by Wiz. Well, firstly, I will tell you where I am from, because that is very important for me. Uh, I'm from Concepcion, that's right, but I'm from the Bio Bio watershed, a very important and sacred for the Pehuenche people, the native people from the watershed. And at the moment, I'm living in the Isar watershed, a tributary of the Danube. And for me, that is very important, because I think we all come from different basins and knowing where we come from on where we take our water is also very important and like i know actually i drink the water from the mangfal which is a nice river that also is a tributary uh, of the big danube so okay what's the home river biofits it's basically an activity where many people around the world met around their local rivers to survey the local biodiversity but the, how did they all start it we with a group of friends which is called the river collective work work in uh, river conservation in the Balkan region. Serbia, uh, Slovenia, Albania, for sure you have heard about these uh, countries, maybe in um, Kustuitsa movies. And we wanted to do that last year. Of course, we didn't know when we were uh, developing the project. In Serbia, in Belgrade, in the middle of the city where the, the Danube and the Sava, both big rivers, meet. But yeah, COVID happened and we had to postpone the activity and we thought okay let's do it but then in September then we didn't know like everything was going to be like really long and strange and COVID still was there and we were like okay oh we cannot do this citizen science activity in a place okay what can we do let's do it small activities all around the globe and so started this idea of the home river bio blitz which was just like for us we thought at the beginning was okay we will get three four five activities this in uh, different countries in Europe it's gonna it's gonna be something really nice and little and then suddenly when we started like developing this uh, project I got an email from Africa like from Rwanda from Claire Mary Joseph and she was like she's a national geographic explorer and she was like yes I want to be there I want to do a home river biopolis here in Rwanda I was like oh crazy like imagine you get an email from Rwanda I'm from South Chile like another whole continent for me, Rwanda is just in like National Geographic videos. And it was like, wow, she wants to take part in this. And then I got, we got mails from different parts in the world, India, Indonesia, and so on. And everybody wanted to take part in this. So basically what happened is that we led this activity, which uh, was around 500 people and more around the whole world, which were surveying the, bio, the biodiversity in their home rivers one day. 20th of September of last year. It's in 35 rivers, 20 countries, all the continents participated. It was a worldwide collaboration between activists, scientists, and citizen science, and for the conservation of the rivers. But let me tell you now first, what is a bioblitz? A bioblitz is basically a citizen science method that started in the USA in the 90s, where you get a, a citizen basically they people that don't, are not exactly uh, citizens but uh, scientists you group them and then you go out into nature and you measure in one or two days like in a really uh, short period of time you make like a snapshot of biodiversity with all these people imagine like 10 20 even sometimes you got you got 100 that is a, a pre covid number and they all were there with scientists and also with sometimes with kids like families everybody was there gathering Information about the species. Okay, that's really interesting. But what's the interesting thing about this is like you can survey a really big surface in one or two days with uh, citizens that start caring about the ecosystem they are participating in. Citizen science may uh, be a very interesting tool for data gathering, and maybe some of you are already into this project. But for those who don't know what citizen science is, it's basically when you have different projects and you also involve people that are not necessarily scientists. There are many cases around the world. For example, there are air survey um, in uh, different cities where you as a normal citizen sometimes get like an artifact, you put it in your house and you measure air quality and there are others related to biodiversity like this one. What do, did we do during the home river bioblitz? Basically bioblitz, this is biodiversity snapshots in different rivers around the world. 
and we use an application called iNaturalist, which you can see here, which is basically with your phone, you download the application and you can take pictures of different species. It's like you document the species and it's not gonna tell you immediately what the species is, but it's gonna come into a, 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 a online community and also an online register of all these species and all their people around the world, like a worldwide community, are going to identify and give you like a name. And they will say, I think it's this species. So it's like a collaboration community for a species identification. It's basically collaboration and science happening together. And we use this application all around the world to measure biodiversity, to take pictures of the plants, of the birds, and all the other animals. For example, here's a little peek into the biodiversity we found. The Utstalage, that's a really important river in the middle of Austria, in the Alps. You can see this nice Sclerosomatidae species. Maybe some of you know it in Chile. We, we also have it in Chile. It's called the Obillon. In, it's, it's a really strange arachnid. Um, well, I, I bet that the person that found this didn't know exactly the ecology of the species. But you start seeing these little creatures or the, these other beings that live with you together in the river. For example, this is Indonesia. This is the changeable lizard. This was also seen in Jakarta. This all happened in one day. You have, for example, in the Salinas River in Mexico, this lag sparrow, which is really beautiful. So you can see here the power of gathering people and going out and not only measuring, but documenting and seeing hands on what is living outside, what's living, considering that your home is way more than these four walls where we are sadly at this moment, it extends beyond, for example, the trees, the other species living on the trees by the river, in the river, all these plants that Maria talked about, they are all also living beings. And sometimes we think they are only the landscape, part of the landscape, and we think they exist only as objects. But in this case, we related to them as subjects. They were living beings, we were measuring them, we were considering them important. And also something very interesting about the, uh, this bio -blitz is that all these people, like, I don't know, like, uh, from five persons to 10 or 15, all taking care of the COVID measures locally, were out seeing their own rivers. And we have all these people, for example, uh, she's three, she's from um, Indonesia, she's also a national Ge uh, geographic explorer, she's living in the UK, in the Don, uh, by the Ron Don River, and she went outside, she's an architect, with her friends, they were measuring biodiversity, and were really amazed, and they have these other a whole new perspective to the river because the and now they were seeing all these species living also in the river with them. For example, you have here people uh, from Rwanda uh, measuring also they went to these streams, they were not rivers but were creeks, and we're also all together there. You have, for example, the people in Indonesia, the Chilibun River, and the Chile. what's interesting about this is that basically we were not only measuring biodiversity but stories. All these places had stories. In In the case of the Chile River, it's a river that Indonesia, and it's a very endangered and uh, threatened river by pollution, like you can see here, but also because they are uh, channeling the river. So what's interesting is that this initiative also pushed forward the locals to care about their own rivers and also to organize themselves to fight, for example, in this case, for a non-channelization of the uh, Chile River, because it's threatening also the biodiversity diversity of the river and the riparian biodiversity of the border of the river. And now these stories were there. For example, Francie and Cara, friends from me, she, uh, they were in, in at the Spree, Berlin. Hey, are, are you, are you, from this mind blowing, one day, all these people outside, rivers, around the world, it's, it was really moving. You see here Rio Nassas, um, these people in Greece, uh, there is Dimi. Well, this all happens because of collaboration, so it's not crazy that I know all the names because they are kind of friends of mine and Dimi was outside with his friends measuring biodiversity in the Blodomatis with Greece and here's the Glamento River one a very interesting river he is Nicolo he is also a friend <laughs> he organized this and it's one of the last uh, free flowing rivers and wild ecosystems in uh, the central Europe it's a very interesting river and they were also measuring uh, river biodiversity there other people 
people, also in, in the in Trento, David, other friends, and so on. I think there's so many stories behind, and that's interesting. So all these people were outside one day taking care of other rivers and measuring biodiversity. And what's interesting about this is that happened around the world simultaneously, and we were connected by digital media. I think sometimes we, we find ourselves thinking when we are in front of the computer, it's like, we sure are tired of these meetings. I think many of us would prefer to be outside maybe, or gather with friends at the evening and so on. And we're like, well, digital media, some digital technologies sometimes seems overwhelming. But here there's a really nice example how digital communities can bring us together and we all can be outside and at the same time inside working together for rivers. Here are all the places. You can see that many of them happen in Chile around Ciber, uh, seven. Uh, many of them happen also in the USA, in Europe, Africa, India, Indonesia, Malaysia. So you can see if you want, I can share with you the story map afterwards. You can see all the different uh, stories of the bio blitz. And why did we go out? So this is all really nice, right? People going out, uh, taking pictures of other species. Sounds nice, but sounds basically entertaining sometimes. So why are rivers important? I could say so many arguments adding to what I already need. Said. But something that's very, very important about rivers, and we all know that, is that they are fresh water reservoirs. Without rivers and without lakes, we don't have water to drink, basically or we will, have, we will use a lot of energy to try to desalinize ocean water. And these rivers are endangered by pollution, but also by either projects, for example. Big dams, big dams like, for example, in Chile, we have Raico Dam, or we have Pange Dam in my own watershed, which is considered a sacrifice zone. In my, in my territory is so destroyed that they talk, they talk about it like it's a sacrifice zone, like a person sacrifice. I think it's that that hurts me a lot and it, it ignites me to keep working for free rivers. And these dams, what happens with them, and this is interesting connecting to what Mia said, sometimes they also produce blooming, for example, cyanobacteria blooming. And these are poisonous. So many times these dams, for example, not only uh, contribute to the climate change because of uh, CO2 emissions and methane in case of the dams, but also because of the cyanobacteria problems. So, well, there are many ecology uh, reasons why we should take care about rivers, but there's also another point. And I'm going, I'm, me, I talk a lot, a lot about ecology, but I'm talking about stories and caring about rivers and citizen science. And you can see here, this is what Christian Beroisa, Pereira said. He's also a friend of mine, <laughs> many friends around the world. And he said, Inchi Taleugu. What does that mean? We are the river in Mapudungun language. And they, they, for these people live uh, by the river also, they all live in a town and they have this Nyenko collective, which joined as well the Home River Bio Blitz. And they saw an opportunity to protect the Bureo River with this activity. Here you can see the amazing Bureo River. It's also it's a new conception. And what's amazing about this is that there's people that not only consider rivers important ecologically, Okay. They give us environmental services, fresh water, blue corridors, etc. But they think that rivers have also a value for themselves. That is called deep ecology in Western philosophy. But also for the native people, many times these rivers are not only objects. They are considered subjects. They are considered as people. That's called sentient ecology. That's an understanding of nature not as an object, but as a subject. And the relationship then that emerges with two other, um, not only species, but ecosystems, is that uh, to a person. So the river for the Mapuche is not only the river, but it's also a person and it's a relationship. And that is very important. But because it changes completely the understanding and the relation to the river. Rivers for my Mapuche people are sacred, and therefore they must be protected. It doesn't matter if they give us, for example, water, but they also uh, have an importance by themselves. But at the same time, we all know that ecosystem services are important, and basically without rivers, healthy rivers, there are also no healthy oceans. Because like Mia said, rivers have, for example, nice diatoms that they bring to the ocean and they 
contribute to the coastal biodiversity. So for example, when you ask yourself, oh, we all know that Chile is a thriving uh, fish economy, right? Like we have all these amazing coasts full of an amazing biodiversity related, many know because of the Humboldt uh, current and also other processes, but it's also related to all the rivers, all the watersheds that are bringing nutrients to um, this uh, biodiversity to the ocean, which contributes also with other processes. This is amazing biodiversity. A big lesson that we learned from the BioBlitz is that rivers unite us. And that is amazing. This is not only about data gathering. I mean, I could show you all the stats. Uh, all, there is a nice website, which is called iNaturalis, where there is like all the species we identified, uh, around 1,900 numbers are sometimes interesting. But in this case, what we really value about the river, uh, uh, Home River BioBlitz, it was an amazing example of worldwide collaboration where rivers gather us and also we use digital technologies to work together online, but at the same time being outside. So the digital technologies can also be a very interesting way to gather people around nature. So not only think about uh, digitality as something that is sometimes negative, but there's lots of possible outcomes. And I must say as a finishing word that I'm very thankful to all the people that participated because we had a really small budget no, really, really small budget. And all these people that gathered together, these more than 500 people, were basically doing this out of love and because they are many times activists and they believe in the protection of the river. So thanks to them all, the River Collective team, and also to Mia and all the persons that were in the LMU supporting me in, in my master thesis, which was related to this, but I won't talk about that. It's just a, another field. And something very important, I think this is a little hint for everybody that's working there in these kind of projects, the power of really nice illustrations and graphics. So also, just to remember, thanks to National Geographic because they funded the project. That was really nice. And thank you all for uh, being here and hearing this story. Thank you very much um, for this presentation um, about the power also of citizen science um, and maybe there is a link we can we can do here directly uh, from from your presentation to, to Mia's presentation and with this we open our, our Q&A we have roughly 10-15 minutes for questions um, please feel free to use the chat function or to raise your hand in case you do have questions but we have a first question here from Susanna. Actually, one question I had in mind too, so I will blend it with what I had in mind. And uh, um, Susanna asks um, if uh, you, Maria, can work with the data collected from citizen science. And this is what I thought too, because uh, if you put me uh, checking out biodiversity next to a river, I won't be able to distinguish uh, the fauna, the flora. Uh, I will make up things. Um, but is this still reliable? Is this still yeah, you can. So, and there are a lot of projects where they use this data from citizen science, right? A very prominent uh, example for this is in Germany, the, the NABU, like the uh, for like they do uh, bird counting. So they always call or they always uh, ask for help from all the citizens in Germany. So they should just. Uh, on a certain day, they should uh, look at their bird feeders for one hour and they should just count uh, which birds are there. So with this, with this data, they really collect information, which birds are decreased, as which bird species are decreasing and so on. So the citizen science data are really important. It depends a little bit on what you want to um, find out, right? So if it's a very particular mechanism, whatever in the food web, then uh, of course, uh, a citizen science might not be the right thing because then you need some more precise instruments or whatever. But there is a very long ongoing um, citizen science in the north of Germany with this was done with the M Max Planck Institute in Plön. It was limnology before it is now evolutionary biology. But uh, so what they did, they introduced a, it was seen transparent, I think it was 
fault. So it was, uh, so they were asking people that they do some, uh, yeah, uh, measurements with a second depth where you can just uh, look for how, how far can you see into the water column and so on, right? And they also trained a little bit some people who were interested how to get the right sample. And then they brought the sample to the institute and they measured it. So that is a long ongoing thing. And the nice thing is that very often investigations are not possible because you do not have the personnel, right? So you do not have the money for person for persons and also not the consistency of a postdoc is two years here. A whatever, a, doc, a PhD student is three years here, but then they're gone. And then you 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 do not have a, a continuous workflow. But if you if you really keep something like that, you can do that over years and years and years. And then long-term data are these nice things. And if you have a lot of data points, that will also kind of calculate out some mistakes you might do, right? So, which is not a problem. But the citizen science is for a lot of things, a very nice tool, actually. Can I add something to Mia's no. answer? Please, yeah. We, we still have a bit of time. We, we do have two more questions. So I will, would have to ask you to be very brief, but yes. Okay. So basically, this is the, the case of this particular uh, case. This is the site in iNaturalist where all the information is gathered. You can see, for example, here the number of species that have been identified and so on. But there are, for example, in the case of iNaturalist, when you upload a photo, people can say, I think this is this, this species. And many people can uh, say that. And there's a triangulation. If more, if three people agree with the observation, it's the and research grade, and then it's of the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, mm -hmm. and you can, all that data, you can download it, and you can use it, like Mia said, uh, to uh, play with stats, and also uh, model biodiversity in, a, in rivers or other ecosystems. And also, there are already papers, for example, using uh, the data of iNaturalist, not basically this particular case of, of iNaturalist. And that's also very interesting, this open open source where you can use it uh, for science. Yes, um, thank you. Thank you, Jens, for, for this uh, add-on. Um, there are two more questions, and the first one is directed to Mia. Um, what are the main pollutants of phytoplankton that people have to be aware of to promote their conservation, is mm -hmm. a question from Johanna Aristisawa. So, uh, a main pollutant, so if Pollutant is something we might need to define, but everything which is too much in there is also a pollutant. So many people think maybe about pharmaceuticals or whatever, which are also as well a problem. But what in Germany, it depends a little bit on where you are. So in Germany, for example, we, we struggle a lot with nitrogen input, right? So although nitrogen is an important nutrient for phytoplankton, but very often if you do not have the right ratio between nutrients and so on, then it might get into a problem. And what we do in Germany, for example, we dump into 365 times more nitrogen uh, per year into our lakes than 30 or 40 years ago. So, uh, so it is quite a problem. So there are, it, that's all from industry, agriculture and so on, right? So that's a very big problem. Another problem is, uh, and I think that also goes to the the second question by Anna, uh, when you go, when you think of your household, right? So what we see more and more, what is uh, also a, a big struggle or which changes the community composition of phytoplankton is that, or from plankton as such is all these pharmaceuticals, right? Because our wastewater treatment plants, they are usually unable to filter out these uh, leftovers, what we, I mean, we take it, we pee, and then it goes into the water, right? So mainly, and most of our wastewater treatment plants, and I would say that Germany has good ones, are not able to filter out these pharmaceuticals, for example. And you can nicely see that uh, there are studies with that, with this whatever uh, carbamazepine and what it all is, right? So the, the ones which are everywhere, basically, that you, that 
that plankton really struggles. Either they decrease in, in, uh, in growth, right? So they just disappear. Or the zooplankton, for example, they really get uh, into trouble. And we saw also in lab experiments quite some nasty things like two heads instead of one and so on. So it was not, not nice. So it is really a, a problem. And they are very persistent very often. So they do not go away or dissolve or whatever. And they are or just gone, they uh, add up over time. And that's quite a, a problem, I would say. But we struggle right now a lot with nitrogen input. Thank you for, for this explanation. We have another, an, a non-question in this case, but I will, I will read it still. Um, uh, from Marianne Fresart, who, who wants to thank, uh, well, in this case, uh, Jens and, and Mia for uh, all these um, presentations you made, you made uh, me, uh, I'm quoting, uh, see things from another perspective. I can't wait to learn more about the topic. So thanks, Plankton really rocks. Uh, and apparently there, uh, <laughs> there seems to be quite a consensus about this. And as we're running out of time, I think this is a good way um, to, to end this symposium, not before I will uh, pass the word again to Susanna. I think we touched some very, very important issues and uh, uh, one more thing that I wanted to mention that Jens, uh, uh, that was like a key aspect of Jens' presentation, we cannot go further into that due to the time that's running out, is the, the aspect of narratives. Um, how you generate a narrative, how you communicate things, uh, be it uh, by using uh, the internet, the, the graphic aspect, the way how, how, to, how to verbalize things is crucial. And you see that now in the, uh, in, in, well, it's, it's banal, but it's in, in everyday life, we're confronted with uh, uh, this uh, virus that has the world like we see it now. And it's all about how you communicate knowledge, how, how people understand what's going on and don't start making up like crazy theories of their own. So I think this is a, a really, really a, a big issue. And here I think that the arts and the sciences really have, uh, um, by, by blending, by working together, really really can work on that and, and making things work better than they are now where things don't communicate always that well so i think narratives are very important and we mustn't forget that science produces narratives and it's very important on how they are produced and how they are rendered to a general audience and i think with this um uh, we we can uh, close this a uh, very very interesting symposium um i think Thank you very much, uh, Maria Schopenreiter, Jetzt Ben, uh, and everyone else who has participated in this, of course, also Jose Miguel Morales, uh, who, who, who has made this uh, meeting possible, Pablo, and everyone else in the team. And last but not least, I will give the word to Susanna, who's organizing this series of symposia, and she has a, an important announcement to make as to the following symposia in this series. So I'll pass pass the word to Susanna, say thank you to all from my side as well. Thank you, Mario, and uh, thank you all. I think that was amazing. I really learned a lot. And um, next time when I jump into a lake, freshwater lake, I hope I don't come out with two heads. I still have hope. Yeah. Um, and um, that was really interesting for me. Also, the BioBlitz River, I haven't heard about this project, and it's very interesting. I think there's a lot of potential over there. And I would like um, to announce the further symposium we are organizing. We are actually, we are co-organizing. We're always in uh, a team yeah, with uh, German University, uh, Chilean University and the DAAD. And in May 18th, we have a symposium um, from the perspective of sociology. It would be very interesting. I got just the title of one um, speaker. And in June, on the 10th, we will have a very important symposium with arts, music, and geoscience. Yeah, um, I think Alejandra Rudolph is participating in this symposium, and she will one, be one of our very special guests in this symposium in June. Um, so I'm happy uh, to invite you to follow this theory, to follow this um, issue of climate change, and um, to have different views. Yeah, I think that's very important, very interesting. 
And um, once again, thank you to everybody for your commitment with this symposium, for all the support um, and to be with us. And I would love to make a 